I'm Richard Freeman and I'm the Chief Exec of Always Possible. We are the events partner for, for Driver Arts Driver. I think this is now getting on to our 30th event uh, as part of the, the series uh, and each one is completely unique and uh, uh, full of lots of really fascinating learning and collaboration. So uh, it's been a real joy to be curating these events. Um, and uh, the structure for this one as one of the wide angle events is that you will hear from a number of contributors and I'm really delighted that we have got with us today uh, Anna Dimitriou and Alex May, we have Irene Pepper Dimitriou and we have Donna Close um, and that is uh, uh, artists and uh, and researchers talking about the the collaborative potential of driver arts driver and how data is being used in both the, the creation and curation of art uh, in some really extraordinary ways so um, we're excited to introduce them in a second then I will ask some uh, some questions and we'll have a little conversation between the presenters and uh, and myself just drawing out some of the points that they've made and then as I said we'll be open to you to take part in uh, and bring your thoughts and ideas to the table so do start thinking about some of the things that you might like to ask and then at the very end we'll we'll preview a few um, other events that we've got coming up that we think that you'll enjoy so um, if we're all ready to go and everyone is set then I'm going to introduce Donna Close a senior research fellow from the University of Brighton uh, who is going to set the scene for the driver arts driver project where it's come from and, and where it's going and where we're at and talk a bit about the the art strand uh, of the program Great, brilliant. Uh, thanks very, thanks very much, Richard. Um, just bear, thank you very much for um, all coming as well. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Great. Is that working for everyone? Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. So, um, as Richard said, I'm, I'm Donna Close. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Brighton and the, what we call in academic circles the principal investigator uh, for Arts Driver. Um, my practice is really as a festival director um, uh, and an event producer uh, and also a cultural strategist. And what I'm interested in is about how artists and cultural producers um, generate impact uh, through their work, particularly relating to new technologies. Um, uh, there's lots of images in this and most of them are taken from from uh, the Desire Lines exhibition, um, which I'll talk about at, at the end. Um, but first of all, all, I just want to do a little bit of sort of scene setting really and tell you about Driver Arts Driver. Um, so, um, uh, Driver Arts Driver, so Arts Driver is one half of a converged project called Driver Arts Driver and it's, so it's a bit like STEAM in that respect, it's talking about how creativity um, sort of amplifies uh, the value in, in, in projects um, and it builds on <coughs> the learnings from the Brighton Fuse report, it's quite a few years old now that report but still a, still, still a, a very good one which talks about really how arts and humanity um, is particularly suited to like the, 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 the 21st um, economy in terms of uh, innovation and being flexible and agile and coming up with like new concepts and new ideas. Um, it stands for Digital Research and uh, Research and Innovation Value Accelerator. I bet you're pleased that we didn't use the, the full name for that. Um, and, and you can see it's funded by the European Structural Investment Fund, the University of Brighton and the Arts Council of England. <coughs> and it's specifically targeted at the coastal capital region. Um, and the coastal capital is the local economic partnership area that goes across to Bognor and up to Chichester. Um, it's um, the project provides SMEs with access to Gatwick Airport's data. So they've they've made their data, which is usually um, something you have to pay for, available to the project to be a sort of almost like a sandbox for for people to play with. It's a, it's a program of um, curated events, a training program um, called Focus, which is starting next month, and which I sort of highly recommend you sign up to via the platform. And that's led by data scientists and been designed by um, Professor Karen Cham, who's the PI of the driver part of this program and then one-to-one -one support and advice online resources um, a matchmaking platform um, and and also some parallel sort of primary research that the University of Sussex are leading on 
Um, and then also the Superfuse prototype funding. Um, and that's what we were so delighted um, that um, Anna and Alex, they applied for that and Susceptible was funded um, from, from that little pot of funding. And um, we've got the current round of that is open now. So, you know, please do, do have a look at the website and you'll see, see some resources about that. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to give you a bit of the context was to explain that it's really a sort of Superfuse project in itself. It's, it's like, it's half about enterprise and digital businesses, those high value, high growth ones. But it's also about impact and it's about the, sort of creative focus and the added value that um, artists bring to these sorts of conversations and it treats data as both currency and uh, and a material um, so arts driver in itself it, has a, it also has a number of um, different strands so there's the always possible uh, events always possible are real experts are about understanding the creative economy so we curated this program with them um, it's also um, the Superfuse funding programme, which we talked about already, and then dedicated support from um, our fantastic uh, Creative Future Knowledge Exchange Manager, Stuart um, Headley or myself, that you can um, access. There's also, also a number of like discrete projects as well. So we ran some artist residencies at Fusebox with Wired Sussex. They, they happened last year, which were 12 artists and um, spent six months in residence at the Fusebox, um, which is a co-working space that um, ha also has an immersive studio as part of it as well. So it was, it was for artists to get up to speed about what data was and also about the sort of new immersive technologies as well. Um, we also supported um, the semiconductor performance at Halo at the Brighton Festival that never was because of course uh, that little thing called COVID uh, has affected that but we're hoping that will come back next year. And we're doing a music data and innovation conference with CMU, which will be running in October. And the reason we focus on music data is it's particularly, uh, if you look at the coastal capital area, there's a, there's a lot of music businesses and SMEs in, the, in this region. And, and, and actually, because music was one of the first sort of creative art forms to, to really um, go purely digital, um, there's so much data uh, involved with the, the, the music industry. And we think that's quite an interesting sort of line of inquiry. Um, and then there was the Brighton Digital Festival partnership um, as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So what is data? I mean, one of the really interesting bits of learning for me um, in, in terms of this project is about actually it means very many different things to different people. I mean, but it's like extraordinary. I mean, look at some of those uh, facts and figures there. Um, that two and a half quintillion bytes of data uh, are produced by humans every day. And quintillion is um, 18 zeros. So like extraordinary amount of, of number every time you sort of uh, interface with anything digital, which is pretty much all the time um, you're generating, generating data. So it's a, it's, um, a, you know, it's, it's sometimes called the oil of the new economy, I guess. Um, uh, and, and I think that's, that's apt because, you know, the other thing is, is it's not only is it disputed and means different things to different people. It's also got very many different states. It can be unprocessed in the same way that oil can, but it also can be pro processed in, in a completely complex um, load of ways. Um, it's problematic. You know, there's questions around um, ownership and privacy, um, the lack of transparency, uh, you know, what we're giving our data up for. Um, also, the whole inbuilt bias as well, which is very well documented, especially when you start looking into things like artificial intelligence. You know, uh, it's quite worrying when you think about actually who has access to this technology and who has access to the learning around data um, tends to be quite a sort of, you know, uh, only a particularly small group of people who have got the, the, the uh, sort of, so it's quite a privileged access with um who are inst institutional and corporate gatekeepers, I guess, uh, and that raises a whole set of problems. Um, and of course, artists and producers, we know we've got quite a lot to bring to this, not just in terms of the diversity aspect, but also in terms of wider public engagement and also about innovating as well. Do you know what I mean by, you know, the, the whole idea about when artists are working with data, they're making the invisible visible, you know, and by making it visible, tangible, experiential, then that enables a much wider group of people to deal with it as a um, you know a system but also deal with it uh, in terms of its implications as well um, so what we try to do is to design a process where you know how do you engage with artists and, we, and so we've looked at every aspect of what we would say is like the idea or the value pipeline in uh, for, for artists and cultural producers so that's about knowing it's there the knowledge which these events try and do inspiring people with 
um, uh, in, you know, artworks and also case studies, uh, really sort of um, helping a bit of hand to hand sort of um, uh, planning, not just in terms of technically what might be needed, but also in terms of where the project might go. Um, and then finally, you know, the producing of the work, the sharing it um, through ex exhibition or through dissemination as well. So try to try to, to, to create the, the whole sort of ecosystem, I guess, of culture, try and um, uh, apply it to this question about what is data and also how can data be used to create new uh, services, products and experiences. Um, so um, I, this was our um, one aspect of um, the Arts Driver project, which, which, um, um, which, I, which, which I led and I co-created with, with Lawrence Hill and I thought it was an interesting one just to look at in, in answer to the question about, you know, how do you create and curate with, with data. So it took part last year as part of the Brighton Digital Festival. Um, it ran for two weeks um, at the Edwards Street School of Media campus um, and the 16 artists took part and, uh, and that diversity was really important to us. So we had um, diversity in every sense of the word as well. So we had some emerging artists, we had artists that are very, very well established we had artists who worked within the a more sort of corporate and commercial um, uh, sector and we also had um, very much sort of community grassroots artists and also artists who worked work in academia as well um, it was diverse in terms of the experience that the audience would have as well so we um, had some screen based work we had some um, uh, app based work um, some installations um, some um, two-dimensional prints as well so it was really trying to to show the the breadth i guess of the way that artists are engaging with data and new technologies and we supported it by an events program to try and sort of really dig below the surface of that as well and that was really about um you know uh trying to uh, inform a wider public about um actually how accessible some of this stuff can be but also sort of illustrates more specifically about the types of um enabling technologies um, and applications that artists were using in order to make sense of data so this um sort of flow chart type thing I guess is a, is a mapping of the curatorial framework that we developed and this was this created a bit of a, a platform for for Lawrence and I to go and do some investigation into different sorts of sorts of artists and I think pulls out some of the key strands of the inquiry from an arts right, driver point of view so I'm just going to shut my window because my neighbors decided to start drilling right so they are um, about the aesthetic materiality of data the real world's made of data, um, the portals through data and the data revealing human movement. So, so in terms of thinking about the specific data that we were looking at, which was the Gatwick data, it was about thinking about, um, thinking about it both in terms of material, but also in terms of what that meant in terms of um, how um, it was, um, I suppose, reflecting how human, be human beings navigate their way through, through real and virtual spaces. Um, so I'm just going to sort of drill down into just um, three pieces of work just to, and there's links there um, to, to, because obviously one of the things about digital work is a lot of, uh, a lot of it exists online, which is really great as well. So I do sort of recommend that you go and try out these links. But it was just to sort of try and show the, the variety of approaches of um, the, the artists that we were engaging with, how they were working with data. So this first piece is called Familiars and it's by Wes Goatley and Georgina Voss. It was actually developed in 2015, but it was updated uh, in 2019, um, um, specifically for the Desire Lines exhibition. And what it does is it, 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 it uses Brighton's proximity to Gatwick Airport on the English Channel and it basically scrapes the data from the movements of planes and boats um, and it in, in, interprets them and maps those onto a, a floor based projection, but also into an into a, a soundscape as well. So so when you're in that space space you'll feel the um uh, the increased times of when there's more and more sort of boats and planes that are, are flying over you know in actual very very close proximity to where you're physically standing in brighton but but actually you know something that you're not really aware of so it becomes a really interesting sort of ex experience to to really feel um all of these transits and transportations that, that that's happening around you um, and what they've also did, which I thought was the, which was the new um, adaptation for Desire Lines, was they also monitored the carbon that was produced as well, so that you'd also see, a, a, you know, the accumulative impact 
um, on the climate that was happening as a result of um, the, the, you know, the, the sheer movements. I mean, interestingly, obviously, when we showed when we showed this piece of work back in October, um, Gatwick Airport was uh, at full throttle, and and um, I think one of the interesting parts of the project has been, of, of course, like the impact of COVID has, has, has had at least a temporary impact on the amount of flights going through. But but it was um, uh, it was a really interesting sort of stark reminder of, of, of actually just how much transportation in is happening around us and the and the the, the cost of that environmentally. Um, so this was a new this was a, a relatively new artist, Akila Bertram. Um, uh, a really fantastic artist and, and, and her piece was an interactive installation um, called Return and um, so especially commissioned for um, the Desire Lines exhibition but in partnership with the Frequency Festival of Digital Culture in Lincoln so it's basically two thresholds basically um, uh, and it was uh, in terms of its conceptually it was related to the door of no return in Elmina's castle in um, Ghana so these were the, the doors of no return of the sort of last glimpse that many enslaved African people had of their homelands. And that, that's what she was just about the connection of the African diaspora uh, to a homeland that they might not ever be able to, to visit and, and vice versa as well. So what she was really interested in exploring was about how, you know, you could uh, communicate even in a very basic way with uh, people who weren't there. So, so during October, we had one threshold in uh, Lincoln and one in, in Brighton and, and audiences were able to not talk to each other because we're used to doing that. We can do that on Zoom or we can do that on our phones, but actually to use their body to have like an embodied um, uh, connection with someone who's not there. And then the uh, final piece that I wanted to talk about is um, a piece from Max Colson called London Knowledge. So, this was a, is a piece of work that is um, a series of prints. It's a film and it's also a soundtrack. Um, and it's based on the knowledge, the London knowledge that uh, taxi drivers take when they're, when, when they're in London. So, um, and, and the, the potential impact of the leader technology, which is the technology that self-driving cars are using. So this whole idea about, you know, will this new technology drive out this artificial knowledge that's gained from um, this software? Will it, will it drive out the need for um, uh, taxi drivers, taxi drivers that have got this learned knowledge and lived knowledge of, of London. Um, so it's really interesting. It, it creates something very, very beautiful. It's uh, these are the colours that the technology uses in order to make distinctions about depth and breadth and uh, and all of that, all of that sort of stuff. It's um, it's bouncing light beams to and from physical objects in order to do that. Um, but it's accompanied with this soundtrack where you're actually talking about these same places that you're seeing, but you're hearing the perspective from a London cab driver and. And often these cab drivers are, are reminiscing about, you know, sometimes they're calling these particular places by, you know, pubs or shops that are no longer there. You know, it's a, it's a sort of historical and quite nostalgic approach to uh, a, a route, you know, and that's what you buy into, I guess, when you get a cab as opposed to a self-driving car. So it, it places lots of questions about that. And it's, a, and it's also a very sort of beautiful, um, a beautiful object as well. Um, so, that's pretty much me to be honest actually I just wanted to, to show you some of these works but like I say I really do um, suggest you um, check out these artists and um, and also look at the driver arts driver website and you can you can see the whole list of the 16 artists and, and go and look at their work because it's a it gives you a really interest, interesting perspective about how artists are engaging with data Thank you very much, Donna. A really comprehensive tour of uh, of, of the whole program and the um, the ambitions for it, uh, and and some of the the key examples of works that have been um, linked to it so far. I really enjoyed what I saw of the the Desire Lines exhibition. Um, and as Donna says, there the, the the Driver Arts Driver website is the place to go, and we are going to keep plugging it throughout. Uh, but um, there is a, a whole world of links to um, uh, to artworks, to resources, to, to, to funding, to all sorts of things there. Um, so I'm now going to uh, bring um, Anna and Alex into the conversation. They're going to talk about their piece of work as data and art in action. You know, here's a live example of, uh, of, of, of the wonder of what happens when you bring the two together. Um, and they will talk you through their piece of work. So um, Anna, I'll hand over to you. Right, thank you. Um, so yeah, we've 
been working on a project which is called Susceptible. Um, and I'm going to give a bit of background on that and the background to, um, to the piece uh, and to our work. And, uh, and then Alex will talk more about um, how we actually incorporated the data in the piece and some background to that. So just a bit of background to me. Uh, I'm the artist in residence on a project called Modernising Medical Microbiology at Oxford and with a group called the National Collection of Type Cultures at Public Health England. This is the um, oldest collection in the world of pathogenic bacteria. Um, so if you know anything about me, you'll know this is my ideal job. Uh, but uh, I'm also a um, visiting research fellow in computer science at Hertfordshire University and at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in the Centre for Global Health. Um, and I was the 2018 president for the science and the arts section of the British Science Association. Got a few other projects on the go at the moment. Um, we're coming to the end of the susceptible project um, and then it'll be in the dissemination phase. But we're also um, together jointly artists in residence on a project called Fermenting Futures at uh, BOKU, um, the University for um, Biotechnology in Vienna. Um, we've recently completed uh, EU Starts Artist in Residence programme with Schindler. I'm working on another EU project with the Chick Consortium looking at uh, genetically modified chicory. I'm um, working with the Art Data Health Project, which is also with the University of Brighton, working with a charity called RISE. And at the, I'm, I'm Artist in Residence at the Helmholtz Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells. So you can see I work very much at the interface of art and science. Uh, and I'm Alex May, I'm working uh, more on the sort of digital side, so uh, really exploring the impacts of technology on society and history and culture and uh, from the perspective of somebody who's, who's been programming a long time and, and using all these technologies for, for quite a while. Uh, so along with Anna, also visiting research fellow uh, at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, and working with the, uh, yeah, the Schindler Project, the Chick Consortium, uh, did a big commission for the Francis Crick Institute, which is the UK's uh, Centre for Genomic Research up in London, uh, which I'll mention a little bit about uh, later on. Uh, and I was the working with Anna to do the sort of technical side of the uh, project uh, susceptible. And I should also mention that I actually trained at the University of Brighton. So it's really lovely to be actually doing a project with the University of Brighton after, um, after many years. Um, and I trained in fine art, um, although I work very much at the interface of art and science and with biology. I use all sorts of different media. I worked, I, I originally trained in painting um, back in the 90s. And I think those kind of method methodology still inform my work and this is a small section of a piece I made called the MRSA quilt um, which has been shown in lots of different settings and actually made with the superbug bacteria MRSA um, which means methicillin resistant staph aureus and it's a storytelling quilt that actually uses the live bacteria and its making in interplay with antibiotics and it kind of reveals this story of antibiotic resistance which Dame Sally Davis, who's the former chief medical officer of England, said was as big a problem for humanity, as big as as big an existential crisis for humanity as climate change. So um, a lot of my work is about kind of making this tangible, making this explicit and engaging people in this question. Um, and these quilt squares, the blue is the MRSA bacteria and I grew textiles in petri dishes with the bacteria and used different antibiotics to kind of control their behaviour. So you can see um, this bacteria is um, susceptible to um, vancomycin, which is the centre square. Susceptible means it can be treated by it. Um, so if a, if a bacterium is susceptible to an antibiotic, it means you can treat it with it. Um, on the other hand, at the top, um, you can see a little square that's um, got some embroidery with yellow on it. And that's um, um, embroidery silk dyed with turmeric, the spice. And the bacteria, is, although it doesn't grow quite up to it, it's a little bit off-putting to the bacteria. You would definitely say that that, um, that, that was resistant to turmeric. Um, there's a lot of stories that turmeric's very good for things like that. It's, it's actually quite 
hard to get it to work. It's not, an, it's not a successful antibiotic. It has some anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and coming from that, uh, I was talking to Irini, who um, is here um, and is working with us on this project. And she, she said to me, it would be really nice to do a project at the gallery she was curating at the time in Waterman's Gallery. And we developed together um, a proposal to do a project called the romantic disease around tuberculosis as I was working a lot with um, the MRSA quilt was made as well with the modernizing medical microbiology project at Oxford and they were trying to basically revolutionize um, how microbiology is done with modern techniques so using genomic techniques so you can look at the whole genome of the bacteria and from that you can see what genes it has for antibiotic resistance and things like that and I started to work with um, Tim Walker there who told me all about his research and the history of tuberculosis which I became obsessed with and fascinated with and have been very much focused on ever since and this device here is an antique pneumothorax machine that was used to treat TB, which is, it primarily affects the lungs. And you, they would introduce air with these needles that you can see into the chest cavity and collapse the lung, one lung of the patient in order to give it a rest. Um, because rest, before antibiotics, the rest cure was all we had for TB. The, Pneumothorax machines then being carved, I carved it with the texture of a lung infected and damaged by TB and doctors who work in the field often approach me and they say, oh, it's the lung tissue and they, they spot that straight away. Um, on the cylinder in the, in the devices is, is an engraving based on the um, microscope images of tuberculosis. They call it the characteristic scattered red ribbons. Um, it's quite hard to diagnose TB because you can't see it very easily um, under the microscope. Um, it's quite hard to find, they're quite small with all the other cells, but we can, we can do a lot more with genomics now. And there, as we see now with COVID, there are lots of um, stories and myths, this works for it, this doesn't work for it, things like that. And with TB, this has all happened in the past and we had a huge kind of, lots of things and it had huge effects on, on all sorts of things we know. So this piece is called Where There's Dust, There's Danger. And it was inspired by um, the a device of the British Society for the Prevention of Consumption in 1902 that said that the primary cause of tuberculosis was dust. It's not. Um, they believe that when people would spit, the dust would, uh, the spit would dry and form clouds of dust when it was swept up, which you'd inhale and catch TB from. You can't catch it like that. And it's very interesting. We're now sort of living through a time where these kind of debates and discussions are being played out. So this piece is made of needle felt um, mixed with dust. So these are tiny lungs. Some of them have had pneumothorax treatments. Some of them have had uh, got granulomas walling off TB in them, embroidered into it. And all the piece is impregnated with the extracted DNA of tuberculosis, which is a category three organism that I extracted in the lab, um, working with modernizing medical microbiology. And so this, this DNA is actually very safe. You can work with it outside of the lab. It doesn't have any infectious stuff. It is the instruction book behind the organism, but not the actual infectious organism. And this piece is actually involving data. It's, it's called Blue Henry, and this is a Blue Henry sputum cup, which was popularized at the Davos Sanatorium in Switzerland. And they tried to make it a fashion item. This is sort of back in the early 20th century. And the idea would be that people carry it around and spit into it instead of spitting on the ground and things like that. And it's kind of, it's interesting because I, I bought it uh, in an auction. When you pop open the lid, sort of a cloud of dust came out. So I was glad to know that um, dust doesn't actually give you TB because uh, I would have been in a bad situation there. But on the, on the actual... Um, lid of the thing I've, I've engraved this this chart which is the first genomic proof of the super spreader that modernizing medical microbiology were able to do and you can see from this patient zero gave it to patient one and then patient one gave it to everybody else in that kind of map there the little dots where it doesn't have a number are patients which it must have been transmitted to that 
didn't um, appear in the in in they didn't have the genomic samples in their data. So basically, they sequenced all the tuberculosis in the Oxford collection that they had from all the patients from the past the TB um, bacteria that they had stored. And from this, they were able to create this map and show genomically who gave it to who, because you can see minor changes in the genome that you can see are a transmission event. So it just changes each time a little bit. So you can, you can see, you can go, it kind of revolutionizes um, diagnosis and treatment potentially. Um, and that was, that was the next hope. And, and just, it revolutionizes our ideas of how epidemiology works. And this is, we're benefiting from this research now. Um, Sarah Walker, who was one of the bioinformaticians behind this is leading one of the big COVID studies at the moment. Um, and so the, the group that were working on this um, made uh, a new research project, which was funded by lots of different organizations, including the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization. And what they did was created this 14 well microtita assay plate, which had 14 different antibiotics in it. And at every lab all around the world, like tens of thousands or more of, of these, every time a patient had tuberculosis, um, the tuberculosis were taken, whole genome sequenced, and the bacteria was inoculated in the, in the plate. And from this data, and from this massive data processing they did, they are now, now able to say, um, from the genome of the bacteria, which of the first four frontline drugs that the tuberculosis that that patient has is susceptible to. So what treatment they can have from the genome. This is the first time it's ever been done in any bacteria ever. So this is groundbreaking and it's a kind of technique that can now be applied to lots of different organisms and will revolutionize how infectious diseases are treated in the future. So when my, um, my collaborators um, told me about this research. I thought this was a really important thing because it's a global collaboration. It fitted really nicely with the idea of the arts driver having this London Gatwick Airport data available because this was part of the, the project was that you, you needed to combine the London Gatwick Airport data or use that in some interesting way in, in the project. So that data is kind of talking about how this is a, a global collaboration, but actually, I mean, the COVID pandemic actually introduces other, other issues in there, but because the data dropped right off and that shows what a struggle it is and just how important the global collaboration is. But here you can see some, um, some still images of the susceptible piece. You can see you're kind of traveling inside, inside a, a lung and um, you have these clouds of antibiotics, the different colored antibiotics, and you have these, um, you have the TB bacillus, floating around, you have the, the um, Gatwick Airport data kind of flying through and you're inside this kind of environment which is it's, it's quite deeply engaging um, when you're there and has different these different colours come at you and oh, that's your bit and uh, and we use 3D models in there and it's you can interact with it in real time and I'll talk a bit more about that at the very end. The thing is with tuberculosis People probably look at it and think that this is a kind of a niche thing that I'm working on, some kind of niche, niche area. Um, and it's a disease of the past. This is something I would typically hear from people. But some figures for you. Um, I know we love data. So some figures for you that the, for the last available year, which is 2018, that we have global annual deaths of tuberculosis from, um, the um, global deaths annually from TB are 1.5 million per year. And that's been pretty current for quite a long time, actually. The current deaths from COVID-19, and we're in mid-September now, are listed at the moment as 929,000. So you can see, actually, this whole action that we're taking at the moment, which obviously is very, very important, it kind of, it, it's still less deaths than from tuberculosis. And that happens every year. 
but it doesn't happen so much in the West. It happens in uh, low to middle income countries and places where they struggle to get access to the right antibiotics. And there's a huge amount of stigma in the world. So I'll pass on now to Alex to talk about the data side, but I wanted to get those kind of points across. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit um, leading up to discussing what we did in the susceptible piece with the data uh, about some of the challenges of actually working with data uh, generally, because as uh, Donna touched on, uh, there's a lot of it and it is uh, quite difficult sometimes to sort of get your head around what it is and what it represents. Uh, for one project we worked on, um, this is a, a whole genome sequence of just one bacterium from Anna's uh, nose, I think. Um, and it's, uh, so this over here is the sort of the, the full genome. This is like zoomed in so you can see a little section of it. Uh, and this is a 2.4 million uh, data points. Each of these data points can be one of four values. Um, the black values actually shows that there are holes in the, in the data. When they say whole genome sequencing, they, they mean mostly whole genome sequence. Um, but that's about the only bit of data that you can really visually ascertain from, from this barrage of, of information. Um, the colours here are, are fairly arbitrary. The genome itself is, is in one long strip that's actually a ring. So this, this representation of the data is, is actually incorrect and, and is not really conveying the, um, the data in, in a sort of meaningful way, although we did do that in the, in the VR project that we, we worked on with this data. Um, I used another genome uh, for, from a yeast in this installation that I did at the Francis Crick Institute where I used it uh, to generate these colours. So this is the front of the installation that faces out uh, just some pancreas station over there. Uh, and on the reverse side, there are these coloured panels that change over time. And this is the, again, the four data points of, the, uh, of this genome, uh, but mapped to different colours. And these colours would sort of gradually scroll up over the, the sculpture, and the colours would change throughout the day and actually over the year. So it actually became a kind of genomic clock um, that abstractly represented, uh, you know, part, this, this genome is, is used in a lot of different labs. Uh, obviously you can't really ascertain any knowledge from it, but it is linked very much to the, the contemporary research that they do. And when you go back to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of having the knowledge to be able to look at data and understand how to look at it. If we, I was trying to think of the most simple kind of example that I could, and I thought of a triangle, because if you've got a triangle, you can define a, a two dimensional triangle by three data points. You just need the points where the points of the corners lie. You don't actually even describe the lines. It's just these three data points. But a triangle uh, can be dissected and understood in many, many different ways. We know all the angles inside any triangle add up to 180. Uh, we can calculate uh, lots of different geometry and things just from these three data points because we've had this long experience with working with these sort of primitive uh, geometric structures. Uh, and if you play Minecraft or you play any of these sort of contemporary computer games, all the 3D graphics are made out of triangles because they're, they're very simple to work with and very fast and, and quite easy to describe. But the translation of these simple data uh, structures to a screen means that it has to go through this uh, transition where it's converted from a, this vector format to pixels on the screen, which again is an approximation of, of the data that you're actually seeing. So the, the, the mere act of viewing data uh, can often, you know, translate it uh, in, in unexpected kind of ways. Uh, this is a, an image, uh, one of the series that I do called Algorithmic Photography, where I take uh, a video of a scene uh, and compress it, all the frames of the video to a single image, uh, compressing it on the, the time axis. So this is uh, a few seconds of a, a startling murmuration of Brighton Marina. Um, but now you can see the paths that these birds are, are taking and this sort of um, kind of gives you a, a different appreciation of this natural phenomenon, which you've probably seen many times if you, if you live in this area. Uh, 
and it's not pretending to give you kind of any specific knowledge about starlings or, or you know the nature of these birds but it gives you this kind of sculptural uh, take on on the forms that they create as they fly through the air uh, that maybe you'll think of next time you see them and you kind of try and imagine it in your mind the shapes that they're, they're kind of creating um, and it's it's trying to sort of uh, or I, th I think part of the, the way that art works with, with data is it turns you from somebody who's receiving data into somebody who's starting to sort of question it and actually looking at it uh, and from, a, from maybe a personal point of view. Um, but, so, you know, that's how we define algorithms. We, we define, we look at things that happen in the real world like bird flight and we model them. So this is like a, a Boyd's algorithm. Um, that I then use the algorithmic photography kind of technique on. So this is a, a sort of artificial birds, but they're flying in a way that mimic uh, real world birds. And and we use this kind of technique a lot. I mean, the prediction of the weather, we have a we have a reasonably, uh, well, it's a very complex model of, of weather in, in the world. Um, and we all know that sometimes it can predict whether and the two models, the real world and the model, will stick pretty close together, and that means they predicted it well. And sometimes it can just veer off, um, and the the models diverge, and that's when the the, the weather isn't predicted very well. So, uh, in this example, it kind of looks like birds and the way that they fly, but but it would diverge very rapidly if you um, put it against a real world model. Uh, similarly, this is a, a small project I did with with ant trails and leaving pheromones and uh, and I actually created this not from data I created this from uh, the kind of the idea of the way observations of the way that ants move uh, and it ended up generating data but it was it was more um, yeah from from this from the angle of, of an algorithm um, the translation of, of data, uh, this is a project that I did called A Mirror for Remembering, uh, and this was a, a, an iguana dombone, uh, which is pretty big, pretty like this, and it's broken in three parts. Uh, so I 3D scanned the, uh, each part separately and combined it back into a complete model. So virtually I've repaired this uh, iguana dombone that now uh, exists in a, in a sort of virtual environment and can be uh, experienced in that way. I took it further and sort of created this, this uh, Iguana Don Bone Temple um, in, the, in the artwork to uh, sort of that you actually travel inside. Uh, and this idea that, that this object can now exist in more than one place at the same time, even uh, in, a, in a fixed form that it could never previously uh, kind of take. Um, we work together uh, with lots of robotic projects. This is uh, Cyber Species Proximity. Uh, this was from our starts residency with uh, Schindler. Uh, and it's a robot that responds and interacts with body language. So body language being this data that's, that's kind of subconscious to us, uh, but we can pick it up and we can respond to it and create a kind of conversation uh, with this innate um, information that we're giving out. Uh, we don't just, as Donna said, we, we give out, we generate a lot of information digitally, but we also generate it just by physically existing uh, in the world. And, and we're developing tools and cameras and algorithms that can analyze that and extract information like gate tracking and all these things. Um, ArcheaBot was another robot project that we worked on, which was an EMAP um, residency project we did down at Laborel. Uh, it's uh, an underwater robot. Uh, it was, it was, his full title is Archaeobot, a post-singularity and post-climate change life form. Uh, and it's, I won't go into the full details of it now, but it did have uh, a machine learning algorithm inside that, that is based on a real life form, uh, these, these Archaea, which are these very, very old, the oldest life forms on Earth. Uh, they, they developed on hot, you know, air, uh, water vents on the seafloor and and live this very simple life where they just sort of grow these tails and, and spin them and move around. Uh, so we, we sort of created this, this machine learning uh, 
system where it would sort of record the sensor information about its spinning and the temperature of the tank and all this uh, as a sort of vessel to sort of store its its experience and its knowledge and and even though that this was fairly um, you could you could look at it as an aesthetic object you wouldn't necessarily understand what it was doing with all this data um, and i couldn't really tell you but i know that it's storing it and it's acting upon it uh, so we quite like that idea that it's um you know got its own its own ideas about the data that it's using um, so for susceptible we had uh, access to data a live feed of data from gatwick airport and this is one record of one flight um, that we had access to so basically i wrote a little python script and it, it pinged the server every minute uh, and downloaded the latest updates from uh, that the, the, they were tracking and this is the kind of information that we would get and this this information is very rich it's got lots of different dimensionality so it's you know it's got time stamps and it's got uh, where the plane's flying from and where it's flying to and uh, what airline it is and uh, you know the operator and the type of plane and it's sort of very rich uh, and understandable kind of data to work with um, we mapped this all out uh, and recorded the number of flights uh, per day uh, against the day of the of the year. This is Julian days. If, if, um, if you're wondering what that is, uh, and funnily enough, this year you can see there's rather this massive fall off, and this is this is the lockdown. So we sort of were able to witness this in in a kind of real time uh, in our daily updates. Get this kind of real time. Uh, visual mapping of the lockdown from this from this data. Uh, there was still plenty of um, information coming through, but but obviously much much less. Some some days they uh, think there were absolutely no flights at all. Um, so we combined um, that data with uh, some. There was there was a, a database available for free, which is the location of all the airports in the world. Uh, we cross-referenced the Gatwick data with that, so we could add a sort of location um, aspect. Because, and we I think we recorded the data just from the countries that were involved in the trial. Yeah. Um, so the the I don't know, hopefully you can see my cursor, but these these brightly coloured round dots here. These this is the flight data. Uh, and we mapped it along a time axis, so that you get all the day's flights kind of coming over in the night time, it would calm down, and then, um, you know, at the beginning there were lots, and then over to, as you watch the, uh, the installation over time, it calms right down, which reflects that graph that we saw uh, earlier. Um, and we wanted to, to um, you know, all the way that we used that data was to really show that, that it was a massive, international effort that all of these partners were working together to supply each other with with data um, towards this kind of common goal to, of the project uh, and then there's the data we got from the the cryptic project itself they analyzed over 10,000 um, samples um, and the uh, so as Anna mentioned before the, the bacteria uh, the TB bacteria. Each one of these is one of those samples. It's 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 one to one mapped with the database uh, information. One we person. Can, yeah, basically one one case. Um, and the colours uh, for the for the clouds we've got red and yellow here, um, but there's uh, other ones. Uh, there's red. I know you better do this because I can never pronounce. Red this. for rivampicin. <laughs> yes. Yellow for isoniazid. White for ethambutamol, butyl, and peach for Pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> still tricky. Uh, it's still tricky. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we should practice. Um, and they, so the, the bacteria uh, will move towards the, the drug uh, that they are susceptible to in the installation. And when they, when they kind of reach the centre of it, they, they disappear because they're killed off. They're susceptible to, the, to that drug. Um, and working with this, with this project and working with data in, in general, um, you know we kind of really want it to be um understandable on sort of many levels like it would look completely different if we just fed in random data 
you know, it's not it's not a case of like it's just a pretty thing that that would look great if you just chucked in uh, anything. It's like we responded to the actual data and, and sort of presented that in in a the best way that we could. Uh, the interaction. Uh, you kind of come in and you can sort of guide the bacteria around and you can sort of push them towards the um, the different drugs is kind of reinforcing the the message of the work um, and it's it's kind of not pretending to uh, kind of impart more knowledge than it is it's not trying to plot out millions and millions of data points and kind of um, pretend that it's not well, it's not a visualization it's not a visualization but but an abstract visualization it's trying to to demonstrate something uh you know to communicate something very specific uh and i think you know doing so it's, it's striking it's memorable and it's shareable because you can do it with a group of people uh and it, you know we hope it'll be strongly internalized physically emotionally uh, visually as well as intellectually so um the pandemic happened, as we all know. So um, instead of having the actual installation exhibited as we would like to so far, we haven't been able to do that. We did premiere it in the Ever Art Festival of Contemporary Art in Moscow um, a few uh, about a month or so ago um, as a video version. So there's a there's an existing video version, and we did this um, mock up of how we plan it to look. So we'll have a reflective floor and you'll be inside the environment of it, which will be video projected on multiple walls. Um, and the idea with the interaction is, as you stand there, the bacteria, um, a certain set of the bacteria will kind of cluster towards you. And as you move, if you can move to the antibiotic that it's treatable by, um, that that particular cluster of, of bacteria are treatable by, they will disappear. But if you, as you stand in another spot where you're not near um, at the antibiotic that will treat them, they will more and more will cluster towards you. And these will each be a different person, a different life story, um, or almost life-changing story, because the treatment is still very extensive for TB. You're on sort of six months of antibiotics usually of a, of a combination of therapies so having this this um this new research is fantastic for patients as well so the idea is that the artwork embodies this this experience and you yeah as alex said you learn from it and so this is this is the hope of how we'd like to show it next and moving beyond the pandemic the aim is to talk about this but, and maybe to benefit from some of the knowledge people have gained of infectious diseases, of lung infections through the pandemic, but make explicit this big issue around tuberculosis and how it's been with us for so long. So that's it, thank you. Wowee, <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you very much, really, um, really exciting. Uh, lots and lots of questions buzzing through my head and I'm sure there's plenty um, from our uh, audience as well. Um, I want to make sure we've got um, plenty of time for those. So thank you both. You can take a breath now. I'm going to bring in um, Irini uh, Papadimitriou. Um, Irini, if you're able to get your slides up, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Can you, can you see my slides? We can. Okay, great. Thank I'll, you so much for having me. I'll yeah. Get and uh, it's very exciting, Anna and Alex, to hear about to hear more about the project. And uh, yeah, look, looking forward to um, to the installations. Uh, so uh, I'm Irini Papadimitriou. I'm currently creative director at Future Everything. We are uh, a small uh, arts organization and lab based in Manchester, uh, but we work uh, internationally. So. Um, Previously, I was based at the VNA for about 10 years um, and Waterman's that uh, Anna already mentioned. So I had an opportunity to work with many artists who, um, whose work uh, engages with, with data. So I'm just going to share, oops, sorry. I'm just going to share some of these uh, projects here and, uh, and also uh, like our approach in terms of how we engage with uh, critical uh, ideas about data and how we bring in participants, but also different sectors uh, in, in our uh, projects. So um, going a bit uh, back in time, this is uh, actually not, not that far away because this is uh, 2013 at the v and uh, at the um, annual Digital Design Weekend Festival, which I was curating there and uh, initiated in 2010. And uh, this was one of the um, 
uh, one of the labs that um, I had put together to bring uh, different, uh, to, to, to bring collectives, artists, but also scientists, academics, uh, and other practitioners uh, working with uh, data and uh, explore like through workshops, but also participatory sessions with the public, what we mean by uh, big data, but also how we interpret data and how we uh, make sense uh, of data. So it included projects from like um, around uh, climate uh, data sets, but also uh, as you can see the tiny, the smaller picture, uh, in the inset, um, um, yeah, the uh, data cutter project from Goldsmith University, which was uh, looking at sociopolitical data. So it was a tour that we did around the uh, South Kensington area, so people could take, uh, could pick up these prototypes uh, that were designed by Bill Gaver and his team, and walk around the area and uh, get these uh, stories, hidden stories that we often don't um, uh, know about, uh, about the uh, yeah historical but also uh, social and political uh, data about the area, about the uh, yeah the, the location, but also uh, how people lived, health uh, care, etc. And this, this is like a more uh, recent project from uh, the VNA and the feminist data set uh, by Caroline Sinders was um, one of the projects that I included uh, in the last, uh, the last project that I did at the VNA, uh, a display called Artificially Intelligent, which was uh, exploring um, algorithmic uh, systems, but also uh, how this might uh, affect different parts of uh, society and influence the way that uh, we think uh, and, uh, and work. And uh, the feminist data set um, is, an, is an initiative by uh, Caroline to an, and a long term uh, ongoing project where she's trying to, uh, to create, to bring together, to collect and, uh, and make an archive of more diverse uh, feminist uh, data, but also to inquire what we mean by that, and and to explore the uh, yeah to the idea of like non neutrality of data as well. So she's been working, and this is one of the the, the sessions that we did uh, at the BNA as well. Not not this picture, but uh, similar uh, with. Um, groups usually like uh, underrepresented, underrepresented groups so that we can create this massive archive that could be eventually used uh, to, to train uh, in, in mas uh, machine learning. Um, but coming, coming to our like current work at, uh, with Future Everything, th this is a very well known and very uh, much used quote by, uh, uh, yeah, part from Charles Babbage's uh, Ninth Bridgewater uh, Treatise. And um, one, one thing that we've been exploring is uh, like the, the vast, as Donna was saying before, like the vast amount of, of data um, around us, but uh, also our kind of, um, uh, obsession in society with collecting everything, with collecting data, and also with quantification and monitoring. Uh, so obviously, Charles Babbage here talks about the uh, the air as one huge uh, library that uh, collects every single word that has ever been spoken and actions as well. And these, and also in the same uh, treatise, Charles Babbage is talking about the possibility, like the that one day there will be a computer that will be able to rewind all these uh, actions and words and bring them back and materialize them. And this was uh, the starting, a kind of a starting point and inspiration for Rafael Lozano Hemer and his work, Atmospheric Memory, which um, we co commissioned with um, Manchester International Festival, Science and Industry Museum in Manchester and uh, Electra Arsenal in Montreal and uh, Carolina um, Performing Arts um, at Chapel Hill. And uh, we presented this project, that was uh, a long uh, term project and uh, it, it was uh, presented in 2019 in July as part of the Manchester International Festival. And um, what the, the idea of, of this project was to explore uh, atmosphere, taking as a starting point uh, Charles Babbage and uh, his, um, his saying, but also to think about atmosphere in terms of like surveillance and monitoring, but also in terms of uh, weaponization and uh, drones and, uh, but, and of course in terms of like uh, climate and environmental change. 
and uh, the the uh, exhibition was uh, housed at uh, next to the uh, yeah, in the Science and Industry Museum in um, in 52 shipping containers. So it was this massive uh, scale space uh, where people would come in and get immersed, but also. Uh, where everything that they were saying or that uh, every um, every action, every move of theirs would be collected and monitored and used in the um, in the installations. So it was uh, this kind of uh, slow unfolding of uh, of what was happening and how Raphael was kind of uh, collecting people's uh, data in the space. Uh, but also that was um, for us uh, an opportunity to create. Uh, events and from uh, discussions, but also uh, workshops and uh, guided tours to bring people together to discuss the ideas um, of the that that Rafael was exploring in his work. Um, and uh, thinking about, of course, like what Rafael has been doing with his with his work is uh, another kind of uh, again quite well known. Um, uh, work uh, this time by Borges and the uh, on exactitude in science is something that I've been thinking all the time in terms of uh, the this um, uh, obsess obsession with collection and uh, and cartography and mapping of the world and uh, and, and quantification and in this um, passage like uh, Borges is talking about th this is supposed to be uh, um, apart from a travel, a travel book from a fictitious, a fictitious writer, Suarez uh, Miranda. And uh, he, he's talking about like an empire that uh, developed an advanced uh, cartographic uh, science that uh, ended up creating this vast map that was as vast as the empire. So again, it goes back to uh, how we, we think about, we look at the world and uh, uh, how, how we reflect back and how we are kind of recreating vast amounts of, uh, of data and, um, yeah, of, and, and what is surrounding us. Um, some other um, uh, examples of the work that we've been doing, again, uh, trying to engage with, um, not just with how artists are um, bringing data to their work, but also with, the, um, with current issues. Uh, in this case, uh, By the Code of Soil by Cassia Molga was uh, another work that uh, we produced at um, Future Everything. And this is uh, created by Cassia with Scanner and um, Grow Observatory. I'm sorry, I forgot to put their names there. And uh, it's, uh, it's a project that was part of the GROW Observatory, which uh, is a European-funded uh, project that uh, involved um, uh, connecting um, growers, uh, scientists, uh, academics, and communities across Europe uh, to think about, like, to, yeah, to manage better their soil, to grow healthier food, but also to think about climate action. And by the Code of Soil was developed uh, while Casa was part of this uh, project, uh, but also engaging with the farmers uh, across the, um, the different European uh, uh, groups that were part of it. And what happens, this is a networked uh, piece. It's basically a virus, that's how she calls it. And it can be downloaded and then it is uh, activated every time the um, satellite Sentinel-1 uh, passes over your location. And uh, what it consists of is uh, uh, it draws, the work draws on uh, data from um, uh, like humidity, like sensor, soil humidity uh, sensors uh, that were created and distributed to all these, uh, to all the locations for a GROW observatory. And with a scanner, they have created this visual and um, audio uh, um, Vis yeah, visualization and sonification uh, of, of this data and thinking about like the, all the activity and making us aware of all the activity that happens underground uh, that we don't think about, but is really uh, vital for our food uh, growing and also for our uh, environment and uh, health of land. And, um, and another, um, another example of, uh, again, using, uh, working with artists and uh, trying to yeah bringing um trying to uh, 
yeah, engage with these ideas about like where data is coming from, who uh, in this case, like uh, who owns it and uh, what, what is missing from these uh, data sets and uh, wh where is it coming, yeah, where, where is it drawn from. Is everything every time, which is a, a public um, realm uh, installation that um, we have been uh, touring in uh, cities around the world and um, Everything every time, uh, with everything every time, Naho Matsuda, the artist behind the work, uh, has been uh, collaborating with uh, di with different entities to co to uh, use um, data sets like and uh, the work connects to uh, open source like APIs and uh, but also the data is curated as well from the artist in terms of uh, collection. And what happens is that it's uh, what what the artwork does is that it gives you like some uh, sentences or narratives in trying to interpret the data from from the locations uh, which of course is becomes like the, the the starting point for initiating discussions but also workshops about um, working with the data and accessing uh, data and um, uh, Anna Riedler on the other hand is somebody who creates her own data sets and vast data sets for for her work uh, myriad um, Tulips uh, is, is a piece where she created uh, uh, thousands, I think it's 10,000 uh, photos uh, of tulips and she hand um, uh, categorized them. And, uh, and of course, she used that data set to create a film uh, that was using a, a generative adversarial network, but also uh, a lot of your work is uh, kind of, for me, is really important uh, in terms of how she works with data sets and she categorizes everything uh, herself uh, in terms of thinking about the hidden labor um, in, 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 in huge data sets that we don't even think about, but are used uh, everywhere. Um, and just finally, um, the, this is, uh, I just wanted to share this. This is a, a work by Matthew Plummer Fernandez, uh, customers who also bought, which was presented in an exhibition that I curated at Waterman's. Uh, it was 2017. And um, he, uh, what he's doing here is um, he's uh, exploring the on online consumer profiles and how they are uh, constructed. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, th this is uh, like Amazon. And uh, these portraits uh, have been created by uh, alg algorithms and who are, uh, that are automatically uh, gathering, kind of finding shoppers and, uh, and, the, and product images. And it's a really interesting, uh, for me, it's an, it's an interesting piece that it kind of reminds me uh, the fact that very often we are uh, conceived as data and uh, and of course uh, talking about like the current moment it's something that we've been thinking a lot in terms of how much we've been online and um, how um, how important it is to to think about how our identities in online spaces and uh, and thinking about the the web as a kind of uh, a potential kind of public space and how we could be viewed as n more than consumers. And um, I just, I didn't mention, like, I have been working with so many artists over the years uh, who have been um, uh, engaging with, uh, with data sets in different uh, ways and their work has been so inspiring. So uh, obviously there's no time to mention everyone here, and, but I just wanted to share uh, like a few people who have been doing really amazing work, Julie Freeman and Har Hannah Redler at the Open Data Institute with their um, Data as Culture project, uh, but also Giles Lane at Proboskis with the Unbiased uh, Fairness Toolkit, um, exploring uh, biased uh, data sets and, uh, and also proposing uh, alternatives and, um, and also an engaging a toolkit for bringing people together from, uh, from kids to policymakers to uh, understand where we need change. Um, to another example, I'm just going to pick like, uh, of course, Algor Algorithmic Justice League with Joy Bolamini doing uh, really important work in terms of how uh, sharing stories about how um, uh, often algorithmic systems uh, uh, might um, uh, create uh, like yeah break like people's lives or uh, affect people's lives and uh, Stanza who is in the room which is really amazing as well and I didn't know about that 
I'm sorry for that. And, uh, and of course, LinkedIn, Mimi Onoha and Paolo Tirio. And uh, I'm going to stop here so that we have enough uh, time for questions. And I'm sorry for my phone in the background. <laughs> no I'll stop sharing my screen. Sorry. Thank you, um, Irini. Uh, again, a, a wonderful uh, exhibition there in itself of, of examples of, of this work in, in action. Um, Great. I mean, what, what, a, what, a, what a great uh, set of presentations. Thank you, all of you. Um, we, uh, I, we, we've run over a little, so I'm going to fast forward the questions from the audience. So please do uh, put those either in the chat bar or um, feel free to, to, to bring your camera back on and, and raise a hand and I'll bring you into the, the conversation. And I know some of those artists that you've mentioned at the end there, Irini, are also part of... Um, part of our uh, congregation today so if any of them uh, wanted to, to have to take part you're very very welcome to um, so while people are, uh, are putting their questions together um, I've got a, a, a couple I'll kick off with and I'll I'll do one to, to all of you first really um, what we've seen there is so many different examples of how this work has been exhibited, you know, from, from artifacts to, to sort of public realm pieces, installations, obviously uh, some of it exists just in a digital form as well. Um, it, it feels like there are endless ways of, of, of accessing an audience with some of this work. Is there a personal preference for you? Or do you feel that there's a particular way that's, 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 that works better than others? Or has there been a way that you've experimented with that has really surprised you in terms of the way that people have engaged with it? I don't know if Anna and, and, and Alex want to come in first. I mean, I, th I think the it's, it's <clears throat> kind of a case by case basis. Um, I mean, there, there are certain uh, techniques and, and things just by the way that we approach stuff or have approached things in the past um, that, that uh, probably steer us in particular directions. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it sort of depends on, on kind of what you want the end result to be, I guess. I think the, um, you've got the different issue now with the pandemic is that you are having to show in like online in these like online festivals so we made the video version of it but that's not how it's not our dream version of it like I showed you the the, the image of how you would exhibit as a, as a kind of full body immersive experience is is how we would like that piece shown and I think it's very important to have contextual information however you can do that alongside the work and objects and tangible things I often incorporate DNA and biological forms alongside it so that brings the the stuff kind of more alive I think not alive though it's all dead um, <laughs> usually in my work but but yeah multiple ways like Alex was saying but um, I think it you, but we we have to think about that now as well and I think we're making compromises because of the situation at the moment that's interesting and because you know the example you gave there of the the, the Gatwick data doing that and then obviously suddenly falling and, and that in, in a way um, well in a very big way informing in your the, the end result of your work or the ongoing result of your work do you feel because you're using real-time or real-ish time data there is a compulsion in the kind of way that the work's presented so there's a bit more of an urgency to get it out there to be to be part of a, of a dialogue in a different way perhaps to if you were preparing a piece for a, an exhibition in, in you know that wasn't led by a kind of real-time data does that change the way that you work i don't i don't i think i think it actually probably makes the piece a bit richer to have that drop off in it um because obviously when we first designed the project and started the project and the project was commissioned um we didn't know there was going to be a global pandemic i think i think i was i was somewhat aware that there was something happening in China in December because I follow all the microbiology blogs and and have all that stuff but I didn't think it would come over here we suffer globally I think from something called optimism bias so why that is why they were always slower to react to something that hasn't kind of happened before and what's interesting is it is happening all the time and we just don't no, because with with the tuberculosis data that that that's happening all the time 
Um, but it's, it's this issue of this, the, the reason we wanted to use gap week data was to make explicit this idea of the global collaboration. But then we have this situation with the shutdowns and, and things like that as well. So it, it makes it, uh, it creates a tension in the message, I think, which is kind of interesting. And to, to actually see the impact of a pandemic, which actually kills less people each year than TB, um, and what impact that has is, is, is kind of interesting there, I think, to make that explicit. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and that, that data drives some of that tension, uh, which, which is what makes this really exciting. Thank you. There's a question for Donna from, from Dan. Um, it was particularly taken with the idea that the London cabbies data was being used to create art. Uh, you, you may or may not know the answer to this, but have the cabbies fed back? Um, has it has it made them look at their at their own work in a different way? I don't, I don't know. You have to ask Max, the artist, to because I just presented it. It's Max's Max's work. I mean, he was one of the artists that came to talk to us. It was very very interesting because actually what he said to me, which I thought was really interesting, was that he hadn't set out to create a piece of work that. Um, I guess, made everyone think, oh, you know, we're losing the knowledge of the London cabs. He said he didn't set out to do that. So, the, um, and actually, you know, a lot of the cab drivers that he interviewed were, didn't feel particularly threatened by the self-driving cars in, in a way. Do you know what I mean? So, so um, he was very much talking about, um, I don't know, he didn't want to be explicit with about an interpretation. He wasn't trying to do a campaigning piece of work about saying digital is bad, new technology is bad, you know, look at, let's, let's preserve the old ways. He certainly wasn't trying to do that. And I, I thought that was interesting because that was certainly my sort of take on it. But um, I don't think that was the same for everyone who saw it. So it's quite, quite interesting. So that sort of like leaving it open for interpretation. I think is really important to making the you don't want to feel that you're being told something specific because actually that's how that's that's how data is used all the time isn't it is to tell us something that they've already you don't know I mean there's already a sort of political intention to it so actually to be presented with it but not to be told what to think about it I think is really important really interesting mm -hmm. absolutely to bring Irene in maybe um feel free to answer the, the, the question I put forward before as well about the different ways that the work's presented and if, if that's um, surprised you. But also maybe to add on that, uh, you know, looking at this, the scale of the work that you've been involved with, I, I imagine, and this is a hunch, that, you know, it brought, using those different data sets brought audiences to that work that otherwise would not have, have accessed it. What do you think the, the potential is for the sort of data-driven arts pieces that we've that we've seen in terms of completely changing uh, a, a way that the, the audiences can access this work? Actually one thing that I forgot and thanks for reminding me was the a, a current project that we have because at Future Everything we do um, we, we work a lot across different sectors so although we are an arts organization we collaborate a lot with um, with the, the tech industry, but also with local authorities and uh, other entities as well. And we've started, um, we're curate, curating and uh, organizing a series of events called Innovate Manchester, which uh, the next one actually is, uh, is in a couple of, no, it's uh, mid, mid October, sorry. And uh, this next event is about data and ethics. And the whole, um, the whole idea of this program was to bring in um, artistic thinking, art thinking, and uh, uh, with, uh, um, in collaborations between uh, industry, academics, uh, SMEs, uh, etc. And it's been really interesting to engage with um, groups that we would, that we wouldn't engage with uh, if we were just uh, working with uh, within like the arts, the, the cultures, the culture sector. And uh, there are so many, I think w one thing that uh, is quite uh, important is how to, and I've been seeing is like how artists have been doing really significant work in terms of uh, changing mindsets, but also helping uh, like things to be done in a different way and be thought in a different way. Uh, like, as I, as I said before, also like Julie Freeman's and Hannah Redler's work at ODI, but also the Unbiased Fairness uh, Toolkit are examples for me, but, but also the work that in the US many people are doing, like uh, Joy Bolamini and, and other groups, Paolo Tirio, etc. is it does influence like groups that wouldn't engage with, with the arts. So it's a really, uh, I think there, there is a lot of potential in terms of uh, thinking um, of like, yeah, 
exchange they are and how we move forward when we do have to think about challenges and issues in terms of like uh, di lack of diversity or like privacy issues or bias in terms of uh, yeah, data. Thank you very much. I've had a question come in from uh, Francois Joseph asking, and I guess uh, this is for all of you, you might have some different perspectives on this, but where do you draw the line between data art and data science? I'm going to throw that out there on behalf of Francois Joseph as a little hand grenade. <laughs> uh, all I can say is I'm just doing art. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in my opinion, I decided... Sorry, Anna. Um, uh, so, as I said, in our projects, like uh, like fused with data scientists as well, and um, like I said, very different definitions of data. I would say, um, I, I mean, like completely different understandings of it as well. So, so I think there's, um, I think data science and data data art uh, are are very different. I might draw Alessa Rini. Did, did you want to to come in on that? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I agree, but also I think it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see examples of how the, the two uh, fields can meet sometimes and what comes out of that. Uh, just very recently, I don't know if you have come across the, um, uh, the data feminist group, and, uh, the, which is brilliant, and, uh, re and the way it was created uh, uh, with a peer review kind of approach, but also uh, have bringing into the the study and the the research and the outcome uh, like of course data science but also bringing in like so many artists and who work with data as to kind of help illustrate ways of thinking about like uh, yeah uh, differently and, and building on that point as a line that um, Alex said I think that I jotted down I probably paraphrased but it, it was something like you know there, there is a need for a knowledge of how to use or, or read this data in, in, the, in, in the first place in order to then you know sort of fully interrogate it. Do you think, um, but what we saw was some really great examples of where there are kind of issues based data projects that are there to you know to provoke or to challenge or to raise awareness or to you know to, 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 to create new knowledge and then there are other examples of where it was you know purely around the aesthetics and the form of the starlings piece for example um as you said you know this isn't about learning more about starlings it was about a, a you know a way of, of presenting their, their movement artistically do you think that there's a, a a barrier for many artists using data but just because they they just think well i don't have that knowledge and i don't have access to the knowledge of how to read or interpret the data therefore it is not a tool that i can use and if so, can we do something about that? Obviously, other than the Driver Arts Driver project, which, which is which is which is doing that. But are there other other ways to to reassure artists that, that they can? I, I think uh, I think you're right. I think I think there's uh, you know there are certain barriers to entry. There are also certain uh, there's a kind of another plateau where where you know you're able to work with data. Um, and maybe you create things that don't necessarily mean anything. Um, you know, uh, sort of see some work where it's just kind of, it looks beautiful, you know. Um, but, but there's something in there that, that uh, you know, sometimes I get a bit ragey about it because I, I kind of don't feel nourished on a, on a I feel nourished on, a, on an aesthetic scale but not, not as, a, as a sort of underlying understanding or something. It, it just looks beautiful. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, it's, a, it's that thing I was saying about, like, would it, would it still look beautiful if you just put random data in? Does the data mean anything in that context? Uh, or is it just they found a nice way of visualising it? Um, and I think, you know, that the... the Thing about digital technologies, the thing about digital tools, they're all out there for, for anyone to use. You have to put in the hours. You know, if you, if you want to go and learn data processing, learn SQL, you know, learn Excel. You know, it's an amazing tool. Um, you know, learn R, you know, the statistical programming language. You know, you have to be able to, it's, it's like even with the triangle, you have to be able to understand how to interrogate the data uh, before you can really understand it. And I think that's, that's often the problem that, that I was talking about earlier when you're presented with a, a new data set 
from um, a well-advanced scientific area of research, whole genome sequence or, or something, <clears throat> and you get this data dump, you don't have the, the, the tools, the mental tools, the, the physical tools to be able to process it and to be able to, uh, to extract meaningful information out of it. And that just takes time. So, you know, we're, whereas, you know, we present these artworks as a finished kind of thing, we, we've struggled and we've, we've been through thought processes that, that maybe aren't apparent in the final piece, but are very apparent in our, in our practice, uh, hopefully over time. I mean, also, you have to like really burrow down into the scientific paper to understand what they actually did, because the, the press release that goes out of what, you know, when there's a new scientific innovation and what the physical experiment looked like and what data that produced um, and how that was smoothed and whatever, because they, they do all sorts of things to the data. Uh, in the bioinformatics side, you've got to understand all that and then work with the data, get the data and then go to that step. So there, there's a, even another layer of understanding in there from actual trying to understand science and, and reading science papers, I guess, is kind of a, a skill in its own right, sort of, to, to, you know, there's the press release and then there's, then there's the science and actually they're very far apart sometimes in, in what, you know, what they're actually saying. It's all about language, isn't it? Um, thank you very much. We sadly are out of, of time. I'm sure that um, if people have burning questions that they haven't asked today, mm -hmm. you all won't, won't mind them ask, uh, you know, tracking you down on social media and, and asking. Um, so uh, there's just a couple of things quickly just to sort of wrap up. Firstly, I'm just going to share my screen again to say a huge thank you to our contributors this afternoon, really, really enjoyable. So to Donna, to Anna, to Alex and Irimi, lots of people saying thank you on the chat. So uh, I know that that's shared. Um, those that are listening in, uh, you will get a, a, a bit of feedback um, questionnaire, very, very short following this. Please do complete that if you can. It's very helpful for us to get a sense of what it is that you've enjoyed about the session or what you would like to see more of in the future. Um, we have loads of events coming up, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the, 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 the People, Places, Personalization series um, is, is just one of a, of, a, of a cluster of events that are happening in the, the last few months of Driver Arts Driver. Um, and we will be exploring all sorts of uh, attitudes towards data as an experience um, in terms of commerce, in terms of, of public mapping and, and placemaking, um, in terms of things like gamification and personalization. So um, a lot of it's looking at the, the commercial world and how that um, interpretation of data is coming in uh, to kind of conflict or to collaboration with us as individuals. And we've got some extraordinary guests and speakers, um, some international speakers, as well as uh, leading lights from the UK. So please do book on those. They are completely free. Um, they are taking place, they start uh, next Wednesday and then we've got uh, sort of three quite packed days worth of things, but please do find all information about those and how to book at uh, driverartsdriver.com forward slash events. But uh, until then, when I hope to see everybody back, uh, have a safe rest of your week and uh, uh, thanks again to our contributors. Um, there will be a recording of this, which we will share so that you can you can revisit and see all of the, 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 the artworks mentioned and the, the organizations mentioned um, at your own pace because there were a lot of them and we, we, can, um, we won't be able to capture all those uh, in a written document. So uh, that's it for me and thank you very much and I'll speak to you all again very soon. <laughs>